Hi folks, Matt Easton here. So a subject which comes up fairly often in all sorts of discussions on the internet actually, uh, but also in academic, academic literature as well, and indeed the fencing treatises themselves, is the, shall we say, not evolution, but the transition from rapiers to small swords. Um, now first of all, what's the difference between the two? The first thing I should state is that depending on the literature that you read, a rapier can mean slightly different things. If we look at Zachary Wilde, for example, he's actually uh, occasionally calls the small sword by the name of rapier. He uses the terms interchangeably. And this is true of other literature as well. Um, by the 18th century, the term rapier was really taken to mean any thrust-centric sword. So therefore, early transitional um, small swords that came in in the late 17th century were often known as rapiers or sometimes as small swords. So it's, it's, when we're actually looking at the historical literature it's often actually difficult to discern exactly what someone's talking about. If we look at um, Sir William Hope's treatises for example from the end of the uh, 17th century, the 1690s and through to the beginning of the 18th century, the early 1700s, um, it's difficult to tell sometimes exactly what type of weapon he's describing. Um, most people consider him a small sword source, however he is by date a very early small sword source and I would debate that actually what he's using is something more like what we would now call a transitional rapier, which is essentially something which is sort of between what we'd normally think of as a rapier and what we'd normally think of as a small sword. That is, it is something with a small swordish looking hilt but uh, still probably a fairly long blade on it and not as short as the sort of typical archetypal late 18th century dueling small swords that people tend to be most familiar with which tend to only have in the region of uh, between 28 and 30 inch blades quite short blades very often sometimes up to 32 but fairly short the early small swords have longer quite often have longer blades than that um, however, if we take the archetypal rapier, in this case a swept hilt rapier, and for anyone who's wondering, yes, this is indeed the rapier that we tried to break uh, in a previous video. If you haven't seen that, then look it up, try to look up rapier breaking or attempted breaking, and we failed. Uh, so hence I can still use this for demonstration purposes on videos, I wouldn't use it in actual uh, fencing anymore. Um, but the archetypal swept hilt rapier, or rapier of the 17th century, should we say, 16th, 17th century, has a blade usually really long. I mean, they do, they do vary between about 36 inches all the way up to about 48 inches, in fact, or 46 inches. And um, this is actually a 43-inch bladed rapier. It's not abnormally long at all. It's fairly long, fairly representative of the type for the period. And then a fairly typical, um, this is actually... Uh, around 1800 in dates, Napoleonic period, small sword. And you can clearly see that the small sword was called the small sword because it was small <laughs> uh, compared to a rapier, and indeed small in, in uh, breadth at least, compared to a broadsword or a sabre at the time. So these came to be known as small swords because they're dainty essentially. They are light and they are thin, and of course they give rise to the modern fencing foil. The foil originally was the practice weapon <coughs> for the small sword. Um, so the rapier is a much bigger weapon than the small sword, and people often in literature and modern fantasy writing and uh, just modern sort of media in general confuse the modern fencing foil or indeed the small sword with the rapier. The rapier is a very different beast, as I hope I've made patently clear in previous videos. The rapier is a big sword. This weighs as much as a basket hilt broadsword or a medieval arming sword, or a, mess, a gross messer, um, or a lang messer rather, um, or indeed a saber. In fact, um, rapiers are usually heavier than sabers. Sabers normally weigh about two pounds. Rapiers often weigh about two and a half pounds, uh, up, even up to three pounds and over. Um, so rapiers are fairly big weapons, and really they're long skewers. They can cut to some extent, because they are a sharp, long piece of steel, but they're really um, designed primarily for use of the point, as is the small sword, but the small sword's even more specialised, and really most small swords cannot cut at all. These can only thrust, so this is like an even more specialised version of this. But what I really want to work around to talking about is um, there's a, I won't say misconception, but there's a, a fairly widely held perception, I believe probably stemming from sport fencing, 
history or what they believe is history. So if you look at lots of sport fencing websites, uh, which I don't recommend you do, but um, if you read them, a lot of them have a little history section where they give a history of fencing. And they're usually utter bullshit. Um, unfortunately, sp most sport fencers, not all, but most sports fencers, have a lot of misconceptions about the history of their own sport, and they don't actually understand it. Like the common misconception that I mentioned about a lot of uh, modern sport sabre fencers believe that the legs are off target in modern sport sabre fencing, because sabre comes from cavalry combat and you wouldn't aim at someone's legs if they were sitting on a horse. Bizarre, bizarre idea, and I don't know where it came from, but it's very widely held and I've heard it many times in different fencing clubs. Um, it's not true, incidentally, and I won't go into that because I've spoken about it before. But the fact is that a lot of sport fencers and modern writers who talk about fencing, at least in passing, but don't have an in-depth understanding of the subject, Consider that the small sword is an evolution in terms of it is a better, it is a more advanced object than the rapier. And quite simply, this is not the point. Um, so my favourite C word, not the one you're thinking of, but context, um, is all important here. The fact is that the rapier was intended to be able to fight against basket hilt broadswords, spears, long swords sword and buckler, halberds potentially, all kinds of things. This was, believe it or not, although it was to some degree specialised for civilian duelling, it was used in war. And even in civilian life, you might have to use your rapier against someone who's using a broadsword and buckler, or uh, a longsword, um, or pot potentially even a massive Zweihander. And this is spoken about in the rapier treatises. They actually talk about how to use rapiers against all these varied other weapons, including spears and halberds and partisans and all kinds. The small sword, this is not the case. So this isn't simply an evolution of the rapier in that it's like a better rapier. It's not. What the small sword is, is a sword that evolved in a period where this had become a purely duelling sword or self-defense weapon to some extent but not a self-defense weapon that was ever likely to have to face sword and buckler, longsword or partisan. Okay? This was expected, it had the length and the weight and the cutting capacity and the breadth to oppose and uh, guard strongly against bigger, broader, heavier weapons. The small sword does not. The small sword can just about fight against a back sword, but it struggles at that. And I would always give my money, I would always put my money on the person with the back sword against the person with the small sword. Um, because very simply, the small sword is too dainty, really, to form a safe defense in many situations against the back sword. Your best situation, your best um, sort of advice or strategy if you're using a small sword against someone with something like a back sword who actually knows what they're doing is essentially to avoid blade contact and try and snipe the back sword up and spend a lot of time maneuvering around them and using your point but you're going to be very vulnerable against the afterblow even if you poke them through the sword arm you still might get chopped through the head afterwards because as I've mentioned many times a little thrust unlike in modern sport fencing where you're just lighting up an electrical circuit if I thrust someone with the point of my small sword, it might not stop them. And in fact, history is full of examples of people not being stopped by being poked by a pointy sword. Uh, this is unfortunately a fencing uh, myth uh, that created a lot of problems uh, and a lot of the debate between thrust versus cut and all of this ridiculous um, debate that went on in the 19th century. is this misnomer that if you run someone through with a point, that they'll instantly drop dead. Um, you see a similar thing with handguns used in self-defence, incidentally, and people are fairly realistic now and realise that whether you shoot someone or stab them, they very often don't just suddenly stop. Um, so, the point that I really want to make in this video is that the small sword is not what I would call an evolution of the rapier. It is rather a, a tangent, a, a branch of the rapier. So it's the, there is a type of rapier that evolved into a very specialised duelling sword that was only really intended to be used against other rapiers. 
And that became the small sword. If you think for a second, if, if you're living in a society where men would um, agree as a matter of honour to meet up the following morning or a week, uh, a week from now to ha have a duel of honour between roughly matched weapons, so you know, the same kind of sword for example, um, then so long as you've got similar weapons it actually doesn't matter what the weapon is. We could both fight with rapiers, or we could both fight with small swords, or we could both fight with bowie knives, or we could both fight with pistols. So long as we've both got similar weapons, then honour will be satisfied, and that serves the function of the time. And that's the context in which the small sword grew up. It was a weapon that was worn by gentlemen as a symbol of the fact that they were gentlemen. They were sword-carrying gentlemen who were prepared to defend their honour by the sword or by the pistol in the same period and in fact the pistol became more popular because it was a, essentially a cleaner, more sure way of deciding um, a matter of honour than a sword was. There were a lot of double kills and double woundings with swords which didn't happen so much with pistols surprisingly. Um, so really this is not an evolution of the rapier, it is not a better thing than the rapier. The rapier is an all-round sword designed for self-defence and duels and war that can be used against other rapiers, other swords, broadswords, backswords, longswords, sabres, falchions, and can be used against pole arms such as spears, partisans and halberds, um, and can be used from horseback and in all sorts of different contexts. The small sword is really just a dueling sword. Yes, it was used for self-defence in some situations, but it's not a very good weapon for self-defence. Uh, it will not stand up well against a backsword and it would be fairly hopeless against a longsword and very hopeless against a partisan or a halberd. So there we go guys, my main point. This small sword is not an evolution, a straight evolution of the rapier. Rather it's a tangential development of the rapier in a very specific direction and context. Cheers guys! Click subscribe now and also follow us on Facebook.